Our scripture text this morning is Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. Join with me in reading Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Inviting and engaging and equipping all generations to be more like Jesus. That is our vision. That's the goal that we recently came up with. How do we feel about it? Do we just have this vision to sort of sound good? Or is it something that we put out there that means something to us? Particularly the ending I'm thinking about. Because we are inviting, we are engaging, and we are equipping to be more like Jesus. All of those three first things lead up to the last. Is this something that we deem important? What if we come up with inviting, engaging, and equipping to worship God? Would that have been better? Inviting, engaging, equipping to serve God. Maybe that would have been better. What do we come up with? How do we come up with this? Is it valid? Is it good? Is it something that we feel like we can stand behind and say, yes, this is what we want to be about? Now, I don't know if you all remember, back in the day, there was the, the What Would Jesus Do bracelets. Everybody wore the What Would Jesus Do bracelets and ran around in any given time or moment in their life. They'd say, what would Jesus do right now? I always thought those bracelets were kind of presumptuous. Do we really think that we're going to be... So like you know, we wake up and we think, okay, today I'm going to give my life on the cross for the rest of the world. I mean, you're allowed to laugh. That was supposed to be kind of funny. Maybe not. But you get the idea. You know, could we really ask ourselves to do the things that Jesus did? Can we imagine being as self-sacrificial as he was? Are we called to do that? Can we possibly be like Jesus? Several, almost several, many, many years ago, I was in a three-on-three -three basketball tournament with Ed Plackens and some others. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while I do have a filter. It's amazing. My wife would say I don't. So we were in this three-on-three -three basketball tournament in Harrisburg, and it was a really cool basketball tournament. It's like on the streets of Harrisburg, right next to the water, the, the sort of the river going through there and you know everybody's playing on the streets and one between one of the games we were walking around and we we're watching others play and it's all different ages playing in this thing and there was this one team that just grabbed my attention I could not stop watching them they were these 10 year old little boys playing they were so good they were dribbling between their legs they were doing crossover dribbles back and forth and I noticed they really really liked the fadeaway jumper and as I was watching, I was like, wow, look at these little guys. They all have their heads shaved. They're all wearing red and black. They love the fadeaway jumper, and they tend to play with their tongues hanging out. It dates me, but they all looked like and acted like a guy named Michael Jordan, who was probably the greatest of all time. And I watched these little Jordans running around the court, and I thought, boy, what did they have to do to be like that? How many hours 
that they drive their parents insane, saying, I want to watch that Michael Jordan basketball game one more time. Let me see that shot against the Phoenix Suns one more time, Daddy. I've got to see how that worked. And then the hours and hours out in their basketball courts at home, shooting and pretending to be like Michael Jordan, pushing off on that back foot and doing the fadeaway jumper. How many times did they miss before they started to hit that shot? Now, not any one of those little boys was ever going to be Michael Jordan. But being like him made them a whole lot better. So we can start to think about how being like Jesus might be good for us. But you know, with many things, we want to test it with the Bible. Is this a biblical thing? If we're going to say that our goal is to invite all generations to be more like Jesus, does it make sense in God's eyes? So we open the Bible and we look at Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21. The thing that jumped out at me was this idea in verse 19 that says that we should be filled to the full measure of God. That you may be filled to the full measure of all the fullness. Wait a minute, I keep putting an extra word in there. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That we would be filled with God. And I turned to Colossians, another book, letter, written by Paul. In three chapters, he talks about the fullness of God's nature. In, verse, in chapter 1, verse 28, he says, He is the one we proclaim, Jesus, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To grow in spiritual maturity is to start looking more and more like Jesus. Then in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, giving us this idea of Christ being the very earth from which that we draw our nutrients and our life. We are to be rooted in him. In Colossians 3, verse 3, you died... Your life is now hidden in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Listen to that again. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I love that. It's almost like he's saying that we are most fully ourselves when we are representing Christ. As if each and every one of us, as individuals, were created to bring glory to God and to allow God to bring glory through us. When we are in Christ, we are most fully ourselves, who we were created to be. So you can guess where I'm going. I love the goal. I love the vision. I think that it's the perfect thing that we should all grow to be more like Jesus because growing to be more like Jesus helps us to grow to be better service people. It helps us to grow in our worship. Growing in Christ, allowing Christ to grow in us, impacts everything that we do. How are we doing? In this book, Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard, which is absolutely positively one of my favorite Uh, books in all the world, though I'm not sure that I understand half of it. The half I do understand is awesome. Dallas goes a little bit over my head sometimes. He gets pretty philosophical, theological, and spiritual all at the same time. But it's a fabulous book about putting on the character of Christ. I think Dallas would love our vision. He quotes Gandhi, the Mahatma Gandhi, who was a leader who brought freedom to India from a Christian state, Britain, at the time. He loved to read the Gospels. He was not a follower of Jesus, but he loved what the Gospels said. And he is quoted as saying something to the effect of, I'm not really truly quoting him, but you get the idea. If all Christian people would act like Jesus, we would all be followers of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. Is it true? 
If all Christian people acted like Jesus, we would all be followers of Jesus. Now, I'm going to yell at you all a little bit this morning. Just remember, I'm yelling at myself as well. It's a struggle for all of us. We come on Sunday mornings, and I think we look like pretty good Christians. We come in this place, we hold the door for people. We shake hands, we smile at one another. Sometimes we pray for each other. We come up and we give offerings. We make sacrifices for God's work in the world. We're looking like, we're looking like Jesus followers. We're looking like little Christs. And then we leave this place. And between Monday and Saturday, we find ourselves driving again in our cars, ranting and raving about the people that pull out in front of us. We find ourselves continually looking out for number one, making business deals that are best for us. Ah, the other guy, does it really matter? I'm not so sure. I got what I wanted. You know, something that's funny, I mean, it's not funny. It's sad, really. Often, I will talk to people about businesses to use or not use, like, you know, a construction company or, or something like that, and someone will say, well, don't use that guy, he's a Mennonite. It sort of hurts. We go back to being completely focused on who is the most important, this guy right here, Monday through Saturday. We go back to gossiping at the water cooler. We go back to lingering too long at the computer screen when we know that we shouldn't be. We go back to fighting and quarreling in the midst of our relationships because others aren't giving us what we think we need or what we deserve. It's just too easy. We're human beings. It happens. So how, how, Dallas Willard, do we become more like Jesus? Dallas says that if we want change in our lives, we need three things. V-I-M, he calls it VIM. Vision, intentionality, and means. So we think about these little boys playing basketball. Their vision was Michael Jordan. They saw him. They saw what he did. They saw championships. They saw baskets being made. They saw him being glorified. That's the vision. That's what I want. I want to be like Michael Jordan. The intentionality is the decision. The decision, I'm going to do everything that I can do to be like this person. It's just that simple. We make decisions all the time about that which we're going to pursue based upon the visions that we have in our head of how things should be. And they need the means. The means for those little boys is basketball in hand and hoop outside in the backyard or on the driveway. And hours. And hours and hours and hours. Maybe a mom and dad that are willing to pass us the ball or to get the rebounds for us. We've got to play. For us as Christians, what is the vision? The vision is the kingdom of God. The vision is the way that Jesus lived on earth. Forgiving, reconciling, redeeming, healing. The vision is peace that comes because Jesus died and we do not have to hold on to shame and anxiety. The vision is joy that comes in being rooted in Christ. Having Christ's spirit just living in us. The vision Peace, joy, and hope. The vision is having hope that no matter what happens today, no matter what struggles we face, there is a better tomorrow with our God. That's the vision. So we need to make a decision that that vision is what we're looking for, that that vision is what we really want. And then we need the means. The means, Bible study, coming to church, celebrating, worshiping together, serving God in our community, in the worlds that we live in. Allowing ourselves to let go of looking out for number one and helping others. That's the means. Practice. Practicing the way of Jesus is the means to the change. So what do we struggle with? Why do we feel like we struggle with this Monday to Saturday faith? I just thought about it in my mind. I think, you know, the only thing that I can come to is somehow that we don't completely buy the vision. We don't completely buy the vision that what God offers is really better. 
You know, the world's filled with lots of pleasure. The world's filled with lots of fun. And the world's filled with the, the, the continual commitment to look out what's best for me. And man, I like that. I like to look out for what's best for me. I like to do the things that I want to do. I like to feel safe in the way that I want to feel safe. It feels right. It feels good. We have to believe in this vision that's so countercultural that almost says you have to give up your desire to look out for number one if you really want to experience what's good for number one. Does that make any sense? We have to, in a way, we're human beings, and whether we like it or not, we're always going to look out for number one. But what Jesus is saying to us is, the best thing for you, the best thing for you is to let go of looking out for yourself and look out for others and follow Christ and allow him to be deeply rooted in your heart. And then everything changes. The ways that we behave and we experience more peace in our relationships, in our world, we experience more joy and more hope. We have to buy the vision. My encouragement for us this week is to ask ourselves the question, what vision am I buying into? Am I buying into the vision that my career is the most important thing and that Jesus can wait? Am I buying, buying into the vision that really money, money is what's going to bring me peace or joy or hope? Or am I buying into the vision that dating the right person or getting the right grade on a test, is that the vision that I'm buying into? Or am I buying into the vision of Christ, the love of Christ Verse 18 of Ephesians 3, uh, okay, verse 17. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. We've got a decision to make. And you know what would be amazing, what would be just unbelievable in my mind? To see what the Holy Spirit as part of our means could do if each and every one of us made a new decision this week, a new decision to follow Jesus with more of our hearts, with follow Jesus with more of our time, to walk away from some of that stuff that takes up our time that we love to pursue, to pursue Jesus more fully, what might this congregation do in the middle of Manaheim Township? What might this congregation do for one another? If we took seriously the vision that God gives us for peace, joy, and hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you that we are here today. We acknowledge sometimes we just have to show up. That's the first step. Lord Jesus, help us to see your vision. Help us to see a peace, a joy, and a hope that's so hard to envision in the midst of all the glories of this world. Help us to make choices to intentionally follow you and give us the means, the power of your Holy Spirit to let go, to study, to serve, to follow you, that we might put on the character of Christ, be little Christ's, in our community, and in our world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.